thesis two, the pseudo-populism of today, pejorative epithet as a conservative political critique without epistemic validity. Okay, so uh, uh, the way that uh, populism is used uh, pejoratively um, in Latin America. The historical populism of the 20th century is in no way comparable to what today certain conservative and dominant groups denominate populism or radical populism. With the latter, these groups pejoratively try to deny legitimacy to certain social political phenomena in the contemporary juncture of the beginning of the 21st century. Indeed, the United States, since the beginning of the so-called Cold War, needed a little less than 10 years to organize its hegemony over the free world against the Soviet Union, an unforeseen effect of the intra-bourgeois wars, uh, World War II and World War I. In the West, its old enemy in Europe, Germany, was strengthened through the Marshall Plan against the new enemy, the Soviet Union. In the East, the old enemy, Japan, was reorganized against the new enemy, China. Uh, having finished the task of organizing its hegemony over the North, the United States noted that in the South, regimes swarmed with nationalist inspirations, regimes that, although being capitalist, confronted the United States in competition within the capitalist world market, where the bourgeoisie of the North battles that of the South. As it was to be expected, the North, without compassion, violently obliterated these per, uh, peripheric bourgeoisies that attempted to have a place in the world market. The North American bourgeoisie through the Pentagon launched a war of competition. The competition within the market where one bourgeoisie dominates and extracts surplus value from the other. Okay, so this is all Lenin's, uh, you know, uh, uh, influenced by Lenin's analysis of imperial capitalism where uh, imperialism introduces the phenomena where bourgeoisie from one nation uh, competes against the bourgeoisie of another nation and those with monopoly power exploit, you know, burgeoning bourgeoisie components within less uh, dominant countries, especially less dominant militarily. You know, there's this asymmetry. This, was war, this war was manifest, first of all, in Guatemala in 1954 against Jacobo Arbenz's capitalist project of national emancipation. Arbenz was a liberal bourgeois capitalist, uh, but because he didn't, does, didn't uh, totally give over Guatemala to Wall Street, he had to be taken out. Um, this war was manifest, first of all, in Guatemala in 1954 against Jacobo Arbenz's capitalist project of national emancipation, a project that attempted to give greater income to the workers of the United Fruit Company, a company based in the United States, as a way to strengthen the Guatemalan internal market in order to allow for a nation industrial revolution. This project was not at all socialist. But in the war of the competition between the northern bourgeoisie with the southern one, the Latin American one, there was no proportionality in the power of the contenders. One after the other, the projects of the historical populism of the 20th century were destroyed. In this way, the governments of J.R. Benz, G. Vargas, J.D. Perón, Rojas Pinilla, Perez Jimenez, etc. were destroyed. Regimes categorized as developing were established instead since 1954. The United States just replaced them with, with weaker uh, developing uh, regimes. The dependency theory formulated these events showing that the transference of the surplus value of the peripheral capitalism's global capitalism to the global capitalism of the center, the main mechanism of this transference since the decade of the 1980s is the payment of an inflated external debt, which was to a large extent conceived anti-democratically and hidden from the Latin American people. 
must be covered up ideologically through an economic th theory built ad hoc by the United States and Europe. Again, this is where the World Bank forces loans on governments uh, and then gets them into a debt trap. And, and these loans were never agreed to by the by the populace. They were agreed to by uh, regime leaders put in place militarily by the United States, um, <clears throat> which undermines the eco economies of Latin American countries to this day. This economic theory, denominated by CPAL the developmental doctrine, suggested since the end of the 1950s the opening of borders to the most advanced technology and to the capital from the center in order to substitute imports. Um, and so you get an inflow of capital from Wall Street instead of these countries developing a genuine uh, market exchange, uh, uh, capitalist market exchange on the world market. You get these manipulations, these distortions. This produced the phenomenon of what later would be known as transnational corporations. The truth is that the developmentalism failed because it was only the mask of the expansion of the capital from the center of the domination of the northern bourgeoisie over the periphery, of the center that destroyed and absorbed national capital and that weakened the peripheral bourgeoisie. This task was brought to fulfillment by the dictatorships for national security. From the coup directed by Goldberry in Brazil in 1964 to the first formally democratic presidential elections in Brazil or Argentina in 1983, when the masses, which had in some ways tasted the fruit of the economic political development of populism, were once again oppressed on the basis of a discipline made necessary by the logic of the development of capital from the center, from Wall Street. These dictatorships made possible a new era for the existence of a peripheral capitalism that augmented the transference of surplus value to the center, that took the wealth of Latin American countries and transferred, in balance of payment terms, if you're familiar with that, to the United States, to transnational corporations based in the United States. The implementation of formal democracies after the dictatorships, this is 1983 to 2000, signi signified a political opening of public life that was not terrorized by military repression. This constituted an atmosphere of apparent freedom, which enabled the consolidation of the conscience to pay back the large external debt. This debt, which was initiated by those military governments that repressed the people, would be inherited by the democratic governments. Such governments as democratic justified to the popular conscience the duty to pay the debt while the military dictatorships were losing credibility. In other words, the debt had been legitimized. These formerly democratic, company, country, these formerly democratic governments would slowly turn orthodoxically neoliberal. He says they're formally democratic because they have some elections and representatives and there's, there's this show of democracy, but uh, whether these are legitimate democracies is a matter of debate. Uh, and what these governments that are supposedly democratically elected do is adopt the Washington Consensus neoliberal approach of exploiting the resources of the people of that country and handing them over to Wall Street. Um, the prototypical examples of these are the governments that privatize the public goods, such governments as that of Carlos Menem and Carlos Salinas de Gortari. In this way, the great narrative ignored by postmodern philosophy of the neoliberal theory was put into practice. Uh, Interestingly, he says that uh, postmodern philosophy ignored um, neoliberal, the neoliberal great narrative. They're, they're kind of blind to it. Uh, but there are people 
who were paying close attention. Uh, one of these is um, is uh, David Harvey, which I think I pointed you to uh, earlier in the course. And uh, of course, he is a Marxist. Uh, he, he calls himself an anti-capitalist, uh, to be <laughs> to define himself clearly. Uh, but uh, but in many ways, his work is postmodern. He's he's uh, multidisciplinary, and he's uh, by training a a geographer, and he uses geography. Uh, uh, and in his perspective from the, the discipline of geography to then uh, clearly define neoliberalism before most people had a, a good definition and um, and also to explain um, uh, the continuing evolving nature of capitalism as we see it, especially since the 1990s uh, in a quite um, effective way. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to take a look at him. He's sort of maybe an exception, uh, but he is gaining popularity today. But I mean, he's he's pretty old. He's I mean, I think he's in his late seventies. Uh, I'm not quite sure how old he is, but he's pretty old. But he's still active. He has a podcast um, and has some really good insights uh, from a kind of postmodern perspective. So um, he's kind of the exception to the characterization that. Ducell is making here. This is expressed in the Washington Consensus, which suppressed this great narrative of neoliberalism. It's expressed in the Washington Consensus, which presses for a total opening of the markets in the face of a supposedly unavoidable economic, cultural, and political globalization. The articulation of this is formulated in the left by A. Negri and M. Hart. Um, Uh, now, uh, this total opening is the idea of a free market, an international free market, but where Wall Street has a total asymmetric advantage. So it, it's not, it, it's, it's a freedom for those who are those monopolies to monopolize even further. It's not a level playing field, you know, and, and again, it's it's like the example of the war in Afghanistan, the United States military versus the Taliban. They're free to fight each other in, in whatever way, but there's clearly one who has the dominant power and the outcome is pretty predictable. Although, we see, uh, the United States has had has had to retreat, um, but it's not as if there's an equal playing field there. Uh, it's it's like if you if you um, you show up to a poker game and the minimum bet is a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, you're free to play. Annie up ten thousand dollars. That's that's just to get your cards, <clears throat> and then you you know you gotta push the bet after that. Um, by this moment, the the category of populism had completely changed its meaning. A semantic slippage had taken effect. A political and strategic redefinition of the term. Now, populism means any social or political measure or movement that opposes itself to the tendency for globalization, as it is described by the basic theory of the Washington Consensus. Notice here that now Dussel is criticizing globalization and criticizing Washington elites as globalist, very much along the lines of what Steve Bannon, who was a big inspiration for the rhetoric of Donald Trump, um, uh, just in the way that Steve Bannon would, in, in, in a way similar to the way that Steve Bannon would criticize uh, the Washington global, globalist elites. Um, 
so you know populism begins to really it, it starts to break down uh, our our political categories um, you know that's that's something to keep keep in mind this theory justifies the privatization of public goods in the peripheral states the opening of markets to the products of capital from the center and denies the prioritization of the requirements and needs of the majority of the population, a population impoverished by the political measures adopted by the military dictatorships in an earlier phase until 1984 approximately, and whose condition was worsened lately by decisions about structural reforms dictated on the basis of criteria of a neoliberal economy, which would be in force until 2008 in Mexico. Okay, so we know that he's writing at least after 2008, constituting a shameful anachronism, if not a suicidal one. In the middle of this night of history in Latin America, the uprising in Chiapas in January 1994 signified a beam of dawn amidst darkness. In other words, all the political and popular movements since 19, 1999, taken as a point of reference, the promulgation of the Constitucion Bolivarian, uh, Boliviariana in Venezuela, uh, the Boliv Bolivian, uh, the Bolivarian Constitution and the Bolivarian Revolution, as they call it in Venezuela, that opposed the neoliberal project would be marked as populist. In this sense, the proper social sciences should reject the use of this term because it does not fulfill the semantic clarity of being a denomination that was an epistemically precise, has, that has an epistemically precise content. Uh, epistemically per, uh, ep, epistemology is the study of knowledge. How do we acquire knowledge? And this is a philosophical topic. This is one of the key, um, key areas of philosophy uh, most philosophers have some epistemological methodology uh, and how do you know how do you come about knowing something and um, or what does it mean to know something and what uh, Dussel is saying here is that in this later phase of Latin American history populism and populist uh, is is an epithet used against those who stand up to the Washington consensus, um, but it lacks, it lacks meaningful, it doesn't convey any knowledge. It's not a word that conveys any knowledge. Um, it, it lacks content. This, this term is simply an insult, a masquerading ideological enunciation utilized to sophistically confuse an opponent. It is clear that this that its use happens almost unanimously in the media that serves the peripheral and central capital as well as theories built ad hoc. This term and theories built ad hoc means just on, in, on the moment, just, you know, just sort of scramble to put something together on an ad hoc basis. Um, uh, ad hoc literally means like for the purpose. Um, this term is continuously used by politically dominant groups, groups that oppose the popular movements which battle against the theory and practice of the Washington Consensus. Today, critical popular and political movements are judged negatively as quote unquote populist, just as in the past the historical populism of the 1930s was criticized as military dictatorships such as the ones of G. Vargas, El Cardenas, and J.D. Perón. Um, but, you know, what he's saying is those supposedly dictatorships were genuinely populist and, and popular. <clears throat> the meritorious work of Ernesto Local on populist reason, as well as all the theoretical work of this author, attempts to rescue the positive sense of the denomination populist on the basis of a theory of hegemony through which he vindicates political reason insofar as it is, it either is populist, that is, it responds to the requirements of the consensus of the majority, or it is not probably political reason at all. 
That is to say, political reason is always populist reason and nothing else. It is here that a new problematic begins, and we are on our way to the third thesis of this contribution. Okay, so there is a legitimate use of the word populist, going back to like Perón in Argentina um, in the early 20th century, but there's this later 20th century, early 21st century use of populism, populism of the term populist, that is merely uh, an insult, uh, uh, an epithet, and lacks content. Uh, but uh, as Lacoe uh, points out, there is a, still a legitimate way in which we can talk about, pop about populism, and populism and democracy are terms that overlap. Um, and it really, a legitimate use of populism is a, a government that responds to the needs of the populace, of, of the people. And um, Dussel is going to develop the idea of what he means by the people. Okay. <clears throat> 